السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. نحمده ونصلي على رسول النبي الكريم. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. الحمد لله رب العالمين. الرحمن الرحيم. مالك يوم الدين. إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين. إحدنا السرّات المستقيم. سراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين قال الله تعالى في شأن حبيبي إن الله وملائكته يسلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا سلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على سيدنا ونان محمد وعلى آل سيدنا سيدنا نان محمد بارك سم سل عليه سلام وسلام عليك يا سيدي يا رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم. Continuing with Imam Hussein al Islam in Karbala, and you know last week I had mentioned that many of these people that came against Sayyidina Ali, Karam al Walish are the same people who studied under him. And, you know, it's interesting that it tends to be the people that know the most are the ones who resist the most as well. Because killing or subduing the ego, you know, it is an easy task and at the same time it's not is in order to destroy the ego or control the ego, you, know, you have to be willing to submit yourself, which is what Islam is. It is submission, complete submission to Allah. And, and in so being sub complete submission to Allah, it is complete submission to Allah and His Messenger. So, you know, you have, you know, which, you know, if you look at Quraysh during the time of Rasulullah so some, these are the people who were the most eloquent in the language of, you know, of, of Arabic, the language of the Quran. When they would listen to it, they knew that this was not something that some human being just came out with from his pocket. This was something totally different. And yet they resisted him the most. And also amongst them were also those people who supported him the most. You know, they resisted Rasulullah the most, and at the same time you have people among Quraysh who support him the most. So you have both sides. So on one side you have those who have knowledge, yet not willing to submit. And on the other side you have those who are given the knowledge and are willing to submit. And so the same thing with Sayyidina Ali, Karam al you, know, you had his students who were willing to submit, and those are very great scholars. You know, if you look at you know, the scholars of Islam, all of them trace themselves back to Sayyidina Ali, those legitimate scholars of Islam. So having a good teacher is very important, but having that good teacher and being in line with that teacher you know, following the, the methodology, the ideology, and the characteristics of that teacher are very significant and very important. You know, not simply, okay, I learned from him, but now I'm going to take a different path. This is exactly what Shaitan did. Shaitan was given all of this knowledge, yet he was not willing to subdue his ego. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered Iblis, which is what he was before, be, before he became shaitan, when he donned the dress of the angels, Allah subhanahu wa orders Iblis to bow to Adam alayhi salam along with all the angels. And all the angels bowed, but Iblis says, ah, oh, no. So now he becomes shaitan because he doesn't control his ego. When we 
we look at Imam Hussein alayhi salam, he is a complete and perfect representative of his grandfather. And so when the letter comes from, Imam, from his cousin Imam Muslim, from Kufa, that everything's good, come on. You know, people are ready to support you and protect you. So now he gathers his family and those that are very close to him, his friends and students, and they set out on the journey. So amongst them, you know, if you look at the list of those who joined him, you have 72 people leaving Medina Munawwar. Amongst them, his, his two wives, Rabab and Bibi Sherbano. And she, Bibi Sherbano is actually Persian. She was one of the captives in the war against Persia, along with her sister. These were princesses of, of Persia. One of them married Abdullah ibn Umar. Radiallahu anhu Bibi Sherbano married Imam Hussein alayhi salam. She is the mother of Imam Zain al-Abidin. So his two wives, two of his daughters, Sakina and Umm Kulthum, two of his sisters, Zainab and Umm Kulthum. You know, many of the names repeat. Three of his sons, all of whom were named Ali. You have Ali Akbar, Ali Ausat, who will become known as Imam Zain al Abidin later, and Ali Asghar, who was six months old at the time. Three cousins who are the brothers of Imam Muslim. So these are the sons of, of his uncle Aqil, who was the brother of Ali. So you have Abdul Rahman, Abdullah, and Jafar. Five brothers who are the sons of Ali, but different mother. You know, Ali had six children with Bibi Fatima. Salam alayha. So you, he had. Of course, the two most famous are Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein alayhi salam. He had another son, Imam Muhsin, who died in infancy. And then three daughters, Zainab, Ulm Kulthum, and Ruqayya, who are, which are also the names of the daughters of Rasulullah. So, these two sisters of Imam, Imam Hussein al Islam, uh, Bibi uh, Zainab and Umm al Kulthum, join him on this journey. But you have these five brothers who are Abbas, who is also known as Abbas al Amdar, because he's the one who carries the flag, yeah. Muhammad bin Ali, and it's important, a very important distinction is Ali had another son whose name was name was Muhammad but that was he was known as Muhammad ibn Hanafiya so this is Muhammad ibn Ali so they had different mothers Jafar Omar and Uthman so these are all the sons of Ali four of his nephews who are the sons of Imam Hassan so you have Qasim, Abdullah, Abu Bakr, and Umar. So these are the sons of Imam Hassan. And it's very important to note the names here because two of the names here are Abu Bakr and Umar. And then the sons of Ali, two of them are named Umar and Uthman. You know, you don't name your children after the names of your enemies. You know, which also shows us the connection between Sayyidina Ali Karmallah and the other Khulafa, Abu Bakr, Umar, and Uthman, radiallahu anhu. And it also here, these Khulafa are also represented in Karbala through these sons of Hassan and Ali. 
Two other nephews who are the sons of his sister Zainab, whose father is Abdullah ibn Ja'far. Ja'far Radiallahu anhu, Jafar at Tayyar is the brother of Ali radiallahu anhu, who was martyred in the battle of Mutha. He's known as at Tayyar, meaning, meaning the flying Jafar. Because when he was martyred in that battle, Rasulullah, and the battle took place in Mutha in, in, in the Roman territory, Rasulullah is, is in the masjid, telling his companions exactly what is going on in the battle which is taking place, you know, seven, eight hundred miles away. You know, and he mentions, as he's telling them, he tells them the leader of the, initial leader of the army was Zayd bin Haritha, radiallahu anhu. And he tells him that Zayd has been martyred, he has fallen. And then he tells him other things, and then after Zayd, Abdullah ibn Rao, or Jafir al-Tayyar took the flag. Because the instructions were if anything happens to Zayd, Jafar is the leader, and if anything happens to Jafar, then uh, Abdullah ibn Rawaha will be the leader. And if anything happens to him, then he said, choose amongst yourselves. And a Jewish man listening to this, you know, Rasulullah is in the masjid as he's getting this expedition ready to go. And this Jewish man overheard the conversation and he says to them as they're leaving, he says, these three will not be coming back. Because this is the way of the previous prophets that when they would give prophecy, they said, if this happens, then this. He says, these three won't be coming back. I mean, this was, this was the belief that this Jewish man had in the words of Rasulullah <laughs> And now we question our own belief. So when Jafar is martyred, Rasulullah says to them, he says, Jafar has fallen and he is martyred. His tears are flowing down his eyes. I mean, tears are flowing down his beautiful face. And then he looks up and he says, Wa alaykum as salam Jafar. And so the companions, they ask him, Ya Rasulullah, why did you do this? He says, because the angels, they brought him because he wanted to say salam to me. So the angels brought him from the battlefield here. You know, and they place wings on him and he flies with the angels now. So Abdullah ibn Jafar is that Jafar's son. And he is the husband of, so he's the cousin of, Imam Hussein al-Islam, and he is also the husband of the of the sister of Imam Hussein al-Islam, Bibi Zainab. <coughs> so two of his sons, Muhammad and Aum. So these are also among the group. And then the remainder of the 72 were friends and, and students of Sayyidina Imam Hussein al-Islam. And so they leave. They leave on the 8th of Zilhaj, which is very significant. Because for those who know, the 8th of Zilhaj is the day that the, that the Arkan or the uh, rites of the Hajj begin. So everybody was coming into Makkah and now going to Mina to, to fulfill the rites of the Hajj. And Imam Hussein al-Islam is leaving Mecca towards Kufa to protect the sanctity and the heart and the essence of the Hajj. You know, these were people coming in for the ritual part and he is going to safeguard the reality of the Hajj. You know, because the purpose, if you look at the Hajj, it is nothing or what it should be. It should be nothing but a demonstration of love. You know, when, when, you're, when you're lost in love, you forget yourself. You know, which is why, you know, you don't comb your hair, you don't do any of these things. You know, in Hajj, if you know the rights of the Hajj, what? You know, for the men 
two white sheets of cloth. That's all you wear. No combing the hair, no cutting the nails, nothing. You're just lost in love of your creator. That's it. That is the reality of the Hajj. And that is what all of these rituals of the Hajj are supposed to teach us. And yet, you know, we go for Hajj and we come back and we learn nothing. And this isn't anything new. And again, everybody is coming into Mecca to perform the rites of Hajj or the rituals of Hajj. And yet Imam Hussein al-Islam is going to Kufa to protect the reality of the Hajj. To give the world a demonstration of what true love really is. And as we mentioned before, you know, many people came to him. Many of the companions came to him and said, please don't go. Because you know the people of Kufa. You know, they betrayed your father, they betrayed your brother. So how can, we, how can you expect them not to betray you? And he said, I will go. Because I must go. Because among the letters were also where they're saying to him, they're saying that if you do not, you know, if you do not come and support us, then we will have to give allegiance to Yazid. And then on the Day of Judgment, we will complain to Allah that, oh Allah, we invited him and he didn't come. And because of this, we had to give allegiance to Yazid, knowing that he is a tyrant. He says, I have to go. And to Abdullah ibn Umar, rather, he said to him, he says, my grandfather told me that the Kaaba will be desecrated because of a lamb. A lamb is an innocent animal. So it's because of a lamb. And he says, and I do not wish to be that lamb. You know, because people at this time were still under the impression that evil has some limits. You know, they have something that they hold to be sacred. But the reality is that you know, those who, who, tre who walk on the path of falsehood, they have no limits. And later when Yazid sends his army to the, towards, the, towards Mecca and they desecrate Mecca and, and the Kaaba is, is basically demolished in essence. You know, part of the wall was still remaining. This is when Abdullah ibn Zubair, who was also one of those who said to Imam Hussein al-Islam, please don't go. So he ended up being that lamb. After they had set out, Abdullah ibn Jafar, when they had reached maybe around 35, 40 miles away from, from Mecca, Abdullah ibn Jafar comes running towards them. And he comes to his cousin, Imam Hussein al-Islam, and he says to him, he says, why do you have to go? What is so significant that you are leaving the sanctity of Mecca? at this time and you're traveling with women and children to this far off land where you know the people may be, will betray you. He says this is a secret between me and my grandfather. And I will fulfill my promise to my grandfather. So he says, then tell me what is that promise? He says, I've told you enough. I can't tell you any more than this. As he's leaving Mecca, one of the people entering Mecca was a po famous poet known, known as Farazdaq. Among the Arabs, you know, he's kind of, anyone who knows Arabic poetry knows this name. His father was a very strong supporter of Sayyidina Ali and had fought, fought alongside with him in the Battle of the Camel as well as in Satin. Farazda, you know, poets 
You know, they make their living off of giving praise to people. You know, for those who, who know the history of poetry, you know, even in the past. I mean, these days, of course, poetry is like, it's dead for most, for most places, and especially in English. You know, there really isn't any real poetry. You know, if you look at the poets, it's, well, you have rap now, uh, but, uh, you know, even that's kind of confined to a certain genre. Whereas, you know, if you look at, like, classical poets in, in English, you know, it's like, yeah, they're few and far between. In Arabic, poetry was it. I mean, this was the media. Uh, and even today, you know, you have a good poet, and they can, they can move the people. And so the kings would hire these poets give them exorbitant amount of money to say poems in honor of the king, in honor of the actions of the king, you know, basically to brainwash people. And you know, if someone dangles a few dollars in front of someone's face and suddenly, oh, you know, they got their attention. And this is what Farazdak had become. Even though his most famous poem will be the poem that he says in honor of Imam Zain al-Abidin, which will land him in jail because the king doesn't like that poem. That was, but he said it with sincerity. And inshallah later we may talk about that. So Farazdak is entering Mecca with his mother to perform the Hajj. And Imam Hussein al-Islam asked him, he says that, you know, because he's coming from Kufa, and Imam Hussein al-Islam knows this. So he asked him, he says, what is the condition of the people of Kufa? So Farazdaki tells him, he says that their hearts are with you, but their swords are with Banu Umayyah. And here also, you know, yeah, it's like, I want to do what's right, but my fear of everything else keeps me from doing it. You know, it's like these days. You know, I want to make Jummah, but my fear of COVID keeps me from doing it. So this is, and so, and the other interesting aspect of this is that Abdullah ibn Amr, he came to Farazdaq, because Farazdaq, he knew Farazdaq, and he knew his connection, his family connection with the household of Rasulullah. So he comes to Farazdak when he entered the city and he says to Farazdak as Imam Hussein al-Islam is leaving, he says to him, he says that, why don't you go and join him? You know you want to join him. And Farazdak, he says that I am afraid of what they will do to him. Otherwise I would have joined him. And Abdullah ibn Amr, who was a companion of Rasulullah so he says to him, he says, how can anyone do anything to this man? This is the grandson of Rasulullah. You know, again, this mindset of, oh, even falsehood has limits. When the reality is falsehood has no limits. So this, you know, people, uh, there are people who try to support Yazid and, and downplay the significance of what Imam Hussein al-Islam did. And one of their arguments is, oh, if this was so significant, then why didn't the other companions join him? Because they could not have imagined what was going to happen in, Kar in Karbala. You know, and a simple example of this is the Battle of Badr. You know, in the Battle of Badr, you have 313 companions of Rasulullah Sallallahu Yet, if you look in Medina at that time, you had 2,000 Muslims that were, that were able to fight. Why didn't they join them in Badr? Because they didn't know. When Rasulullah Sallallahu left Medina, everybody in Medina was thinking that he's going to go and stop this caravan. No one had imagined that there would be a battle. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to, distinct, to distinguish these 313 from amongst the rest. 
So the same thing here. I mean, the common person could not have imagined what is going to happen. Because they were all, you know, under this, that, oh, this is the grandson of Rasulullah. So somehow will anybody even think of harming him? Because they had forgotten what had happened to his brother. I mean, if you use that same argument, his brother is martyred. He was poisoned. Imam Hassan al -Islam. How could anyone imagine even harming him? If I go before that, Sayyidina Ali, Karamallawaj. He was martyred by one who claimed to be Muslim. One who said, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Again, how could anyone imagine attacking Ali? You know, we have this tendency that we forget. And leaders, that's the interesting thing. Leaders don't forget. And especially the leaders of falsehood, they don't forget. If you look at the hypocrisy in the Muslim world, this is today, this is nothing new. This is something that's been going on from, you know, time immemorial. I mean, you look at the leaders of Banu Umayyah, you know, with the exception of, of two, maybe one and a half. I mean, the rest are more hypocrites. If you look at the leaders of Banu Abbas, you know, whose kingdom remained until uh, Hulagu, the grandson of uh, Genghis Khan, dis uh, destroyed Baghdad, 1258. I mean, pretty much, you know, with the exception of maybe one or two, all of them are hypocrites. All of them are the enemies of the household of Rasulullah, Sallallahu which is a criteria for being a hypocrite. If you look at the Muslim world today, look throughout the Muslim world today, from one corner to the, uh, to, the, to the other corner. What can you say about the leaders? Other than a bunch of hypocrites. But the sadder part of this isn't that they are hypocrites. It's that we are be willing to believe their hypocrisy. <laughs> Because we keep forgetting what history is teaching us. You know, because we're so engrossed with our own little dunya you know, that we don't take any lessons from anything else. So, you know, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us and guide us, and we'll continue from here next week, inshallah. Uh, may he fill our hearts with his love and the love of his beloved Prophet Muhammad, وسلم, his family, his companions, and all of those whom they love. You know, this, this, this love, if it's true, is what will protect us in this world as well as the next. I mean, that is the only protection. Because it, it, it is what, where, where Rasulullah said, fear the sight of a mu'min. Because he sees with the nur of Allah. And so is there anything hidden from the nur of Allah? No. So if our hearts are truly connected with our Lord and with the, with the beloved of our Lord, وسلم, then our sights will become that nur. And then it becomes easy to distinguish between the hypocrites and those who are not. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. Those who have not made sunnah go and make sunnah, inshallah.